Hello, everyone, and welcome to our live stream all about comparing different data visualization tools to wrap up our conversation today uh, that leads up to our Information is Beautiful Awards programming tomorrow. I'm excited to be here at Excella in Washington, D.C. Uh, with a couple colleagues who are going to be sharing their experiences recreating some different data visualizations in different tech stacks and tools. So some of you may have joined Max this afternoon talking about raw graphs and Flourish and some of the low code tech stacks that are out there in terms of the ways in which we can create these kind of visualizations. And others may have joined us here in person or virtually uh, to hang out with Cedric and Connor who uh, led our workshops in R and in D3 and Svelte, respectively. So as someone myself who doesn't do a lot of code-based data visualizations um, and has struggled to recreate things in tools like Tableau or other spaces, I'm really excited to have everyone here today to chat about these things. We'd welcome your comments and your questions down in the chat box if you're joining us here um, live on YouTube. Um, and we'll also be taking questions from the room here. But our goal today is really to talk about what are the different pros and cons, challenges that we face when taking an award-winning type visualization, like the one selected by our presenters today, and trying to recreate it in different tools. So with that, we're actually going to kick it off and um, hand it over to Connor and Cedric to kick us off and talk about what visualization did we try to recreate in our workshops today, and what were the pros and cons of using some of these different tools. So with that, I will hand it over to Connor and Cedric. Still not working. Uh, wait. Hey. Hello, everybody. <laughs> okay. Again, that's life. So, hi there. We had the idea to recreate some of the visualization of the shortlist for the Information is Beautiful Awards. So, we went through all of them. Fantastic stuff. So, we picked the uh, 538 election forecast for 2020 because there are like several charts in there having multiple levels of difficulty. So just to showcase the page again, or the main page at least, there are a few other sub-pages here. It's a, it's a bit of mapping about the Biden versus Trump election. We have a bee swamp chart. No one of us tried to recreate some, well, would be possible in R. <laughs> um, some distribution here. Then this cool snake we, we also didn't touch. And then especially these line charts with um, labeling and, to be honest, also pretty cool interactive effects here. So I'm going to share what we have created with R in a second, if I can find it. Um, here we go. So we actually kind of targeted several of those. Um, so on the upper left, on the, on the upper row, we see these line charts. So this initially seemed like a pretty simple thing to do and creating just a line chart with, a, with an annotation at the end and a title and stuff that's definitely something you can do within quite some short time but then getting all the other details that the 538 team put in the, into the design choices here was definitely taking a bit more time so we see for example that the lines have a tiny outline so you need to kind of repeat all this um, for the distribution we see on the lower end here this was definitely actually um, pretty tough because we have the highlighted area, lots of annotations and multiple geometries, the bars, the histogram, and then the walling average here. And then thanks to my colleague, uh, we also kind of created the maps, which R is pretty powerful with. But again, like picking all the design details, that was definitely the, the most challenging one. Um, one drawback, obviously, from the ggplot2 library is that it's creating static graphics, so at least in that context comparing these, I wouldn't say static graphics per se are, are downer, but in that case, especially these Hoover effects over time for the line chart, I pretty much like in 538. Um, there are definitely ways to pass it to some interactive graphics um, library in R as well, like something like Plotly or eCharts4R and stuff like that. 
And generally, I'd say like in terms of time, I was able to kind of create several of these visualizations within a few hours. I think we pretty high detail of the overall design. So I'm happy with the outcome. And yeah, that's it for that part, I'd say. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm using it for a while, so I think I'm pretty fast in prototyping these. Um, so these are kind of like quite some code. I think the data preparation was the more tedious part, even though we had the data available. But going from JSON back to a rectangular table format, this was a bit challenging. And then, yeah, definitely like placing annotation and stuff can be pretty tedious in R. I mean, you know how to do it, but still like iterating of like just creating the static graphic and then we moving it a bit more to the right. I'm used to that. That's my daily business. But I get everyone who's like, I'm not going to spend an hour on that, seriously. Awesome. Uh, let's go ahead and, Connor, we'll pivot over to you with D3 and Svelte. Um, talk to us a little bit about the process of recreating some of these in D3. Pros, cons, things that worked well, things that were challenging. Definitely, this is perfect, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, I think you know. I think the people who attended my workshop will probably agree that the hardest part about Svelte and D three, as with any JavaScript based solution, is just going to be knowing all of the moving parts. Right on a high level, whenever we're talking about interactive web development, we're not talking about one language. We're talking about between four and six. You know, we're we're writing HTML, we're writing JavaScript, we're writing CSS, we're writing SVG, and then we add Svelte on top, which is its all new syntax. Um, so the hardest part is definitely getting started. And that's why in my workshop, we focused on one chart with probably the simplest of all of them, which is this, no, I'm just joking. It's not the same <laughs> chart. Uh, it, it is this chart right here. Um, and I think I just opened a new link. It is this chart right here. The dual line chart with the showcasing of chances of winning over time for both Biden and Trump. Um, we chose this so that we could really make sure that we're all on the same page with Svelte, uh, even though it's not, you know, the most uh, award-winning chart in the series, um, but we were able to recreate a lot of the functionality. Um, so, of note here in Svelte, in particular, you know, we have two lines, each with their own attributes. Uh, we have these peripheral elements, like these axes, labels, and ticks. And although for people who use R, that might be quite easy uh, in Svelte and D3, we have to think a bit more about how we're going to design that. So that was a good amount of our, our effort. And then responsiveness and interactivity. So um, really leveraging the tools of interactive data visualization, since this is embedded on the web, we made it really easy to make our chart responsive in Svelte. It was basically probably five minutes, workshop attendees would agree. It was like deceptively easy almost. And then interactivity, um, although we didn't get to the full-fledged interactivity we wanted to, we were able to start to understand how interactivity works within a Svelte application. And so that means these hover events um, and showcasing the hover date and that uh, probability at that given time. Uh, so basically, you know, we split up our chart making into drawing the elements, adding the peripheral elements, responsiveness, and interactivity. And um, we chose a simple chart because we wanted to make sure that we understood all of those steps as we went through. Uh, and I would say, you know, like I said, the hardest part was getting started and just understanding all the languages. But once you have a good handle on that toolkit, Svelte and D3, uh, it makes producing something like this very easy. It would make the transitions between these elements not that hard either. Um, and it would make some of these other charts, except maybe the snake chart, which I still don't really know how I would approach that. Uh, it makes most of these pretty easy. Um, and so I would say the hardest part is getting started, but it's a, a high input with a high output, right? If you commit to learning, uh, you can remake most of these using the patterns that we learned today. And so we try to learn those patterns with a simpler chart. Well, with that, uh, maybe Max decided to tackle the snake chart. Maybe she didn't tackle the snake chart. <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and bring Max up on stage to go ahead and share her insights from having worked with Canva and Flourish, or sorry, Flourish and Raw Graphs, and maybe the little bit different process using the low code type tools and environment that we're working in. Um, and Max, do you have anything you wanted to bring up on the screen, or you just want to go ahead and chat through your thoughts? Yeah, I can bring something up on the screen. Okay. 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 So, so these are pretty 
far away from what, um, yeah, 538 did, but kind of the point of my workshop was more to showcase like how you can get started in those tools and the imagination that you can bring. Because I mean, first off, raw graphs, this one is an example of the line chart from raw graphs. It doesn't have interactivity, but it does um, have, I mean, it's based off of D3. And so like, if you really wanted to, you could bring it back into the code. Um, so I kind of like demoed these different groupings and how they work in both of the tools if you wanted to do it either in code or in Illustrator. But also it only takes like two minutes or maybe like one minute to make a chart. So you, I mean, you kind of get how much time you put into it, but then like everything else is really easy to just um, change into the styles that you need, just there's no interaction. And then for, so I tried to do all of them and I can kind of like walk through. Um, this one got a lot closer. This one was the, uh, the again, the line chart and um, Flourish does has, have interactivity, which is pretty nice, but like still with the annotations, I couldn't get the annotations correctly and had to do a lot of hacking. They also have different data structures um, flourish and um, raw graphs. And so you have to take that into consideration. And honestly, the line chart was the hardest one for me to understand. Okay, sorry that this keeps popping up. Um, and then the bee swarm also had to kind of hack and like say that these were negative numbers and then you'd have to change those. The closest that we could get to was definitely with the maps, um, but still like the styles um, you can't have like custom styles, so you would have to change that. And this one was in Flourish, which has maps and a whole lot of other things. So yeah, that was a breeze through what we did. Can you speak for a minute, Max, to kind of, you had Adobe Illustrator open there, which isn't raw graphs or Flourish. Uh, can you speak to the amount of kind of work that happens after you get it out of that initial tool and what that looks like for folks yeah. who might be with today? so much work i mean that's definitely the bulk of the work is doing the designing outside of the tool um i actually had um i found from last year there was somebody who won um, one of the awards for the data visualization state of the industry and she actually did um if you want i can sh um, share that because i have it uh sure. actually um okay it's in my it's in my slide, but she um, has this is the um, visualization right here, and these two were both done in raw charts. And she put what it looks like before, and then what it looks like after. And this one is like I is seems like especially different, maybe. Um, and this one like has more opacity. Like she probably took out all of the legends and edited it. This one has also um, by Ali Torben been done in raw graphs and this one from Flourish, but essentially with them, you, with either of the tools, you definitely, you have your vision first and like you need to be able to know how to use Figma in Illustrator if you want to get something really custom because they don't come with, I mean, Flourish has like more out of the box stuff, but once you want to start um, like um, customizing these different images with colors or maybe have these lines and then some like text in the middle, you you can't do that in there. And so they're, it, they're often like geared for um, more static images, I would say. All great points. Um, I think that you make an interesting point about stack and like what that looks like and that you're not just working in one data viz tool. I think sometimes we mistakenly assume that people who are really good at say, I don't know, Tableau, build everything in Tableau when really they might be pulling in layers of things that they built in Illustrator or Figma or other things like that, compiling them there to build what they're creating. Um, when you guys are working in D3 and ggplot or R, is that more kind of a full stack solution in one space? Or Connor, I mean, you had Svelte already stacked in there as part of your workshop today. So it's not just in one space there either. So sorry. I was... 
I was trying to unmute, so I kind of missed the question. <laughs> uh, but it was basically whether we use D3 in isolation or with other tools. Yeah, definitely. Um, I would really encourage you to watch the first 15 minutes of the workshop. Uh, it should be on DVS's website uh, because I explain this point very, very passionately because I care about it a lot. Uh, but basically, the difference between a pure D3 project and a project that uses D3 with a framework, in particular Svelte, because I think it's the leanest. And there's this distinct difference between a D3 project where you try to use D3 for everything and a D3 plus Svelte project where you use D3 for its convenient visualization modules and Svelte for manipulating the document object model or DOM. Um, so I talk a lot about it and I'll just call you after this and give you a 30 minute spiel about it if you're really, really that curious. But yes, I definitely use it in tandem with other tools. For me, it's Svelte, but it could be any JavaScript framework. And I think that is the best way to use D3 in the modern day. Yeah, when it comes to R and ggplot, I think we can do the same. So these were all created now in, in, in um, our coding approach. So really like what I meant, like hourly um, moving around these annotations. So what I usually do, if it's really not nothing I need for reproducibility reasons or for automated reason, like having a web um, app or like an automated report, I definitely do the same, like going to, to Figma Illustrator at some point, moving things around so you can export it as SVG. I'm sure if you can ping up, ping up bring up the slides again, just to kind of also illustrate again what you can all do. Like this is all 100% ggplot. So if you really spend a lot of time, so this is some of my work, but also some of other great colleagues working with ggplot, you can see even generative arts and spatial um, small multiples and things like that. So there's a lot of environment in there to also go like, you can go like 10%. So I know Nadi, for example, Brenna, she does it um, using R in a very, just not even changing the theme or any fonts, so or you could basically go 95% adjusting everything and then just placing the labels in the way you want or going for block text, for example, which is not possible in R. Um, so I think, yeah, especially like combining these tools, that's that's the best thing. And I think even if you export it as an SVG, no matter how far, you could then even plug it into D3 or whatever and host it online and make it interactive. So I think really like the power of all of this is it's a great example. And yeah, it really depends on how much knowledge obviously you have to and then also how much time you kind of really willing to dedicate to move it around via code versus doing this by hand i guess yeah there's a lot there in terms of the amount of time that i think people have spent going ahead and doing those like last mile edits and finesse things that are very challenging um, i know we had some folks who were in the room here with us who were part of some of the in-person workshops did anyone have any thoughts from their experiences uh joining today on some of the differences. Ben, you want to go ahead and pull up to the microphone? Sure. Hey. We're going to play fishbowl here in the room since we've got uh, we've got one mic in our attempt to go ahead and make sure that we're not giving you echoes and feedback um, as we go ahead and live in this world of hybrid events where we've got Maxine joining us from the other coast and all of us hanging out here in DC. Sorry, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Ben Chartoff. I, I uh, helped Connor out a little with the D3 workshop and just wanted to add in terms of workflow and tools. We did talk in the workshop, at least the in-person one, about the um, sort of Illustrator to D3 pipeline, for lack of a better term, that making, uh, making doing work in Illust Illustrator, exporting it to SVG, and then especially in Svelte, you can really easily sort of convert that to an interactive um, product or process. Uh, I also, for a long time, did sketching in ggplot and then building in D3, because um, you can do a lot more sort of rapid iteration in ggplot. Uh, the more comfortable I got with D3, the more I just ended up sketching in D3, because it's you know sort of a, 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 a speed and comfort level thing. But especially, I think, early on in sort of trying out different tools and, and looking at different processes. Um, D3, just sort of the way you can cycle through, or sorry, ggplot, the way you can cycle through aesthetics can really let you see data in lots of different ways quickly. But yeah, that's all I do. <laughs> and I know we've got, and I know we've got some folks in the room also working on other tools. Colin, I'm going to call you out. <laughs> Colin's one of the developers I used to work with when I was here at Excella, who's hosting us today. Um, and he does a lot of work in Tableau. I don't know if you have any rapid thoughts. He becomes at the fishbowl. Um, he went through the R workshop today and rapid thoughts on like having done a lot of work in Tableau, which we don't have as represented today, versus something like R. 
recreating these charts and graphs. Any thoughts and reflections on comparing those two tools, a BI type tool versus a uh, bespoke visualization type platform? Yeah, so my first thought is kind of what you were going off of is a BI type tool versus kind of a visualization platform. R gives you a lot more ability to be more customizable within a specific graph or chart type, it allows you to do a lot of those finite changes and has kind of full customization across anything within the chart. While Tableau does have a lot of customization, a lot of things you can do, and especially if you watch uh, Iron Visit the Tableau conference, it can be pretty incredible. It doesn't have that full level of just easy customization within a specific chart, but because it is more BI focused and dashboarding focused, there's a lot more interactivity uh, and kind of business use case and sense of decision making, kind of clicking into things and drilling down. Whereas R lets lets the developer focus on probably like one main point that they want to make and really dig into that. Yeah, sounds familiar. I mean, I've I've rarely touched Tableau. Uh, have know a bit of raw graphs, data wrapper, and some other tools. I think one one main point here, which also I'm not really sure about Tableau so much, but especially about the other online tools or also Excel, it's like the grammar of graphics approach, like really like letting you allow. I mean, it's the same idea of D3 and um, <clears throat> uh, Swelty, I think, that you kind of are allowed to be fully creative and combining whatever you want. So basically, just throwing a thing. If we if we like look at this collection of graphics, I mean, people were building trees with ggplot, showing like bubble sizes with the declining tree population on our Earth, or like this generative art. I mean, this is not data visualization. Um, also, you can do easily maps with hill shading, mixing with color plaps, putting bubbles on top. So, I mean, at some point it might be too crazy, but you're basically completely free to do whatever you want and mix all these things. Yeah. Uh, thoughts from other folks who are in the room today, from the folks who joined these workshops. Any big reflections from going through some of these pieces? Yeah, Francisco, come up and share a question. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's no perfect tool. Um, there's no perfect tool. So I wanted to hear about the limitations of the tools that you guys tried to convince us to use the tool, but now talk a little bit about the limitations. All right, so if you missed that question, the question is limitations on the tools. So what are the limitations? And maybe Max, can we hand it over to you on the limitations around um, using some of the lower code tools that you had plugged in for us today? And I'm going to do this in the right order this time in terms of who's muted and unmuted. It's a fun game of roulette. I, I think I mentioned some of the downfalls of them which is for raw graphs, you can't add interactivity or animation. And there's also a limited amount of charts that you can use. The same for Flourish. Um, although you can, with Flourish, it also depends on the chart type. So different charts can do different things. For example, with line charts, you can make small multiples, but with maps, you can't. And so there's like a lot of chart specific knowledge for that. Another thing is that you can't, um, one thing that I, I'm a developer as well, and I really like to be able to like man manipulate the data while I'm, or like before when I'm making that visualization, like maybe in the same environment, but you can't do that with them. They have like very limited um, data manipulation, pretty much just like delete a row, add a row, maybe transpose. Uh, so those are some limitations, but at the same time, they're really fast and they're UI, and so they don't demand that much advanced knowledge. Yeah, um, not a limitation, just picking up because of the small multiples, because this is something which brought me into ggplot2, and I hope I could convince the people today that this is just a one-line thing, and especially for exploration, also then for communication, this is, I mean, I love small multiples hands down. So that's super easy. Um, the obvious limitation I was already touching up on is the limited thing of interactivity. Depends also a bit on about how we define interactivity. Like, is this about tool tips? Is this about like these cool things? Like really seeing the full timeline, which I think is really something adds a ton of additional information and the user experience. I mean, I mean there's some setups we could like have um, a shiny app with drop-down menus where you basically then load 
pre-rendered or on-the-fly rendered graphics. So these are they're not strictly interactive, but allow for user input. But definitely, this is something you need to know how to code, and you need another level on coding shiny responsiveness, which is definitely in the R world something on top. And if you then want to fine tune that, you end up um, coding JavaScript, HTML, C um, CSS in no time. So I touched upon all of this as well, even though I frame myself as not a programmer and an R person. I did a lot of HTML and CSS stuff on top. Also with GGBot, I mean, I'm using this for years now. So uh, there's a steep learning curve, definitely, to really like uh, doing all the details. So getting a line graph there should be easy enough and kind of put this into small multiple, but especially the mapping part. It's super powerful and kind of can outrule, at least from my perspective, some geospatial people might disagree. I know many people now doing this in R because also you have this reproducibility. But again, you need to know how to do this. And if you run into issues, you might searching for solutions for quite a while. And the same for like really fine tuning. I mean, I'm doing this and I'm perfectionist about that, like getting my custom fonts in, getting the colors in, moving these things around. But I get everyone who says like, well, that's a lot of effort to be added. And for true interactive graphics, I mean, it's a they're using a lot of HTML tools, so most of them are not out of the box R, to be fair. So, I mean, if it's the Plotly R library, it's obviously using a JavaScript library. The same for eCharts. There are some more direct R, um, yeah, R libraries now coming up, and also there might be some ggplot interactive version at some point we are all waiting for. But until then, definitely this is still something which, um, yeah, it's definitely worth to dig into JavaScript and these tools Connor's teaching. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I would answer, but there just are no drawbacks. So it's like, <laughs> You're a liar. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So as I mentioned, like the hardest part about learning Svelte is learning Svelte. And it's just, it's a, it's a behemoth of a toolkit to learn, especially Svelte in D3 in combination. And that's not because Svelte itself is complicated, but because it's built upon three or four other languages. So you need the fundamentals of HTML, CSS, and or JavaScript. Whether you learn it through the lens of I'm learning Svelte, and so I learn those three languages as I go, or whether you learn the fundamentals and then learn Svelte afterward is personal preference, and I think both are pretty valid. I know since I started learning Svelte, my knowledge of all of those tools has grown tremendously. Um, so I, I would just say, you know, if you're trying to produce a quick line chart, if you're trying to produce the dual line chart that we produce today, um, I wouldn't recommend Svelte to be your first choice unless you're already an expert in the domain, right? I think you're committing to a, a longer trial of trying to learn, but if and when you start to develop that mastery, I think it pays dividends. And the last thing I'd say, just kind of like to end on a positive note, is <laughs> um, it's definitely doable. Like, I do not have a degree in computer science. I majored in political science. And I taught myself this toolkit. I'm okay at it. And I think like with enough time, if you're just persistent and you're driven, I think you can learn it, even if it is difficult. That probably goes for all the tools we talked about today. But I think with Svelte and D3, it seems like a really steep learning curve, uh, but it's doable if you put in the time. So, yeah. Max, do you want to add anything? Um, I think that, yeah, I mean, I agree with all of that. It's also, and um, Flourish and um, Raw Graphs, it's also like the imagination that you have. So, yeah. I think that's a really good and key point in terms of what that looks like in terms of having a vision and the imagination piece. Uh, we've got a couple of questions from folks who asked some very practical ones. Do you know off the top of your head, uh, Max or anyone else, will Flourish limits ever expand beyond a thousand rows or columns? Mm -hmm. uh, we had Louisa here from the morning session. She might better know what the product roadmap looks like for Flourish, but anyone know if that is something that might change? Shake heads, yes, no, maybe. Uh, um, we're not the product developers, so that's a great question for our team. And you could ask it tomorrow when Duncan Clark, who's the CEO of Flourish and who is the Data Viz Lead for Canva, joins us to do one of our keynotes tomorrow morning for the second half of this program. So we'll put a link in there in case you haven't signed up to join us tomorrow. Um, other question here in terms of uh, just tools, any experience with Cognos from anyone here in terms of BI experience? <laughs> Seeing heads shaking around the room. I think it's tricky because there's certainly been improvements in what Cognos can do. 
Thelma, you want to speak up on Cognos? Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, well then. Would you like to say any, any words? Okay. <laughs> Thelma, 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 our UX designer in the room says don't use it. I don't know that we want to give that blatant uh, piece of advice from a DBS perspective. We're tool agnostic as an organization, but I think there are challenges to the um, the visualization components of some things. The tools we're talking about today are things that were designed for data visualization, right? Raw graphs, Flourish, D3, Spell, like ggplot. Like these are things designed with data visualization at the heart and core of the service offering versus charts and graphs or reports being a component of what a larger stack does. And I think that that's where you sometimes see some different kind of challenges here in terms of what that looks like. I think that that's re that resonates with the kind of the comment from Nicole even on like, there's a lot of exciting things on DataViz that you can actually pick different tools depending on what you actually want to do and what you want to build. So I would ask folks who are on the line today or folks in the room if you've got suggestions, like how do you figure out what tool to use for what new project? Because I think that's a place a lot of people get stuck. And I don't know, um, Max, when you're, you're a developer who also uses low code type things, what do you do in terms of figuring out which path to take when you're actually doing a new tool? Yeah, this was something that I talked about a lot during the workshop as well, because Flourish and Raw Graphs are actually used by designers, developers, pretty much everybody. And it's not that people use like Flourish or Raw Graphs, but it also depends on what you're using it for. And so if I'm going to make something static and it's just a classic line chart, like I would probably just make it in Raw Graphs and then edit it later on because like adding annotations, D3 is like really finicky about that. And it's a lot easier if it's going to be static anyways, just to like do it, drag it where you need it to be in, in Illustrator Figma, what you choose to use. So yeah, if it's static, if it's interactive, then I would probably try to do it in D3 or like make a scaffold and then um, do it in or make a scaffold in like raw graphs or flourish and then do it in D3. But yeah, it basically, I um, am always like really tempted to try out different libraries and I try out way too many different libraries, but I think that everyone else will agree is that you can do a lot with like a few amount of tools. You just need to know them pretty well and know how to hack them. Can I, can I speak on this briefly? Um, I think that like my decision making tree is always like static or interactive is the first pass because if it needs to be interactive, I think you could use R and ggplotly and shiny. Um, but usually for me personally, because I have a little bit of JavaScript knowledge, I would just opt for something that was like built for interactivity. Um, but that's only because I'm familiar with that. But then I also think that if you are needing something that's interactive and is going to be embedded on the web, then the decision tree is, is this highly complex and needs to be customized or is it simple? And if it's simple, the tool that I actually think I would recommend 99% of the time is Data Wrapper. Um, Data Wrapper is a great tool. It gets the job done. Like every newsroom uses Data Wrapper. Even if you don't know it, they're probably using Data Wrapper behind the scenes. Um, and so I think it's just a great tool. It offers interactivity out of the box and you could download what you have produced as like an SVG element and style it and Illustrator and are anywhere else. Um, so I think data wrapper would be my primary choice for interactive viz, unless it's complex. And if it's complex, I think your best bet is felt in D3. So that's kind of my tree and where I end mm. up. Yeah, can fully agree on that. So we even covered data wrapper, not like hands, hands on, but I showed one of my few things I did in data wrapper. And I, I mean, defaults are just so nice. And I'm really also a fan of the tool itself and the team and all the design choices behind that, to be honest. Like out of the box, it just looks great. Uh, especially what I love is like what I showed the group is like, if you kind of have this responsiveness at some point, the annotations break down to footnotes, which is awesome without any coding. With a bit of additional HTML, you can really turn that into something really exciting. So if I go for interactivity, because I'm pretty hesitant and limited in time on learning D3, it's on my list for long, but still like um, using the, the R things because I'm so fast. So actually, for me, it's often that I, when I use raw graphs or flourish, I often go back to R because I need to reshape the data. And I often get trapped there because then it's like, oh, I'm already here and I know how to use ggplot. But I mean, I have like 10, 12 years of ggplot experience now. So 
that resonates with Ben and Connor's saying like, well, at some point I just use that because that's my regular daily tool. Uh, but to be fair, like what was also mentioned, like um, if you go interactive and want to use Shiny or Plotly or eShots 4R, these also have very steep learning curves. You might better be spending that time on the original tool and instead of having a, an in-between in thing. Because what you often end up with, like you get pretty far with these tools, but at some point you're limited and then you need anyway, as what I said to Shiny, you anyway need to dive into the JavaScript HTML part which then feels a bit limiting. And you, in the worst case, you maybe need to even go back and design the whole thing again without Shiny, without bashing Shiny. And also I have not super production level experience with that, but quite some experience over the last years with working with Shiny. And it's definitely getting better. And these libraries, they work out of the box. But also, again, mentioned that don't forget about that most of these libraries, interactive libraries, are in the end JavaScript libraries. So it's not R. And I mean, that's I think it's also the nice thing that we combine all of those. Um, so yeah, for the decision, it's the same. Like for basic interactive things, I would definitely go for data wrapper or something, and then everything which is data wrangling and then static graphs and really like design, doing it in R, ggplot to some degree, and then moving on to some vector design tool. Um, especially for mapping, to be fair, there's quite some cool implementation of interactive maps. So leaflet and things and handling millions of points on the map Again, it's JavaScript in the back, but that's pretty straightforward with some libraries which are not ggplot. So it also depends a bit. I'm doing a lot of spatial stuff as well. So they often also end up using some other leaflet maps, tmap, and things like that for the interactive parts. Because these are really like just a few lines of codes versus in JavaScript, I know that people are spending a lot of more time on writing code. So that's really the nice thing about R, I think, if you look at the code. And I know some people who do both in parallel, and they always tell me like, oh, if I go back to R, it's just the beauty of like having four lines instead of having 50 lines of code. And also the data format. I know people love the JavaScript format, the nested one, but I'm definitely not a fan. I'm going to try and <laughs> rectangular. I like, like my rectangular tidy data and this nestedness. Um, I mean, I think it's good for, for these purposes, but if you want to then go over to some other tool, you really get into trouble. So the most of the time, actually was preparing the data for the map and like unnesting it and getting some hang of it to kind of really squeeze that into my ggplot in the end. Some strong opinions there. Um, let's see what we've got for more strong opinions. Um, I'm going to go for a very specific question first from the, uh, the community and then to some big ones. Uh, does anyone have a really good tool for interactive decision trees? Open to the room. Anyone have a good tool for interactive decision trees you can recommend to Galen? Raise your hand if you'd like to answer this question. <laughs> no? Well, so I think. Is the, sorry, maybe I missed one. Is the question to develop interactive decision trees or like the decision tree of what tool you're going to use? I think the first. The That's first. Question. Okay. Yeah, okay, yeah. Because I, I think I have an answer for both. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the answer, Why are you asking no, no, no. The answer, the answer for one, like, do I have a good tool, is no, I don't have a good tool. So I have an answer for both. You're just not going to like the first one. Uh, and then I think they're <laughs> – okay, so to develop an interactive decision tree, well, then my answer is no, Galen. I'm sorry. Anyone else in the room have a suggestion on that? Anyone? It's a tough one. If you've got a thought, uh, if you want to go ahead and add in ideas in the chat box while you're here on YouTube or on LinkedIn, feel free to add suggestions. And it'd be a great question to maybe pose in the DVS Slack, which I'll put in a, uh, a plug that DVS Slack is in the paid version right now for the next 45 days. So if you want to dig into three and a half years of rich messaging history, if you're a DVS member, it's a good time to do that. So maybe search for decision trees <laughs> and see what might come up if someone else asked that same brilliant question before. Um, another question that came up from the group was around broadly kind of any comments on best favorite practice places, organizations, or forums to go for resources, um, and besides places that you might not get stunned silence if you're going ahead and asking a question, but where do people go for resources and learning? And, uh, Max, maybe we could go ahead and tee it up and over to you first. Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, I mean, I definitely go to the DataViz community, so DVS would be a good one. And um, I'm also part of the Elevate community, so 
I would probably just ask in there first because you get a lot um, more personal feedback, I suppose, and people are really nice <laughs> if you have specific questions. Uh, for resources and learning, it just depends on what you are learning. And I mean, YouTube is really great if you have something specific you want to learn. And um, yeah, but I would, it, it just, it depends on what, what it is. Sorry for that. Not, maybe not very helpful answer. <laughs> Yes. Um, yeah. Thanks for picking that up. Actually, one of the main points when I kind of advertise DigiPlot2, it's definitely the community. Um, not sure about the other tools uh, because I'm not so much in there, but especially from other programming languages or more data wrangling languages, I'd say, data science languages, R became really a nice place of sharing for free and friendliness, um, of sharing yeah, resources, sharing codes. So for example, the Tai Tuesday initiative, the challenge, the weekly challenge of creating a chart, that's the best place to get feedback. These people are so friendly and they share their codes and they pick up trends of their recent new packages to try out. They always put it up. And that's the that's the main page of Digibot too. So there's this is a general help page, which might be a bit more technical, but we have these cheat sheets, which give you a short overview. But no matter where you look, so I, I feel bad about promoting Twitter currently. And it also feels like it's getting a bit down in the activity, but until, a few weeks ago, definitely Twitter was the way to go. So I often just pose a question, okay, I have a, quite some followers, so I get an answer in no time, way faster than going to Stack Overflow, but also Stack Overflow for coders. And there are dedicated forums for that by Posit, our studio. There are tons of tutorials and blog posts, YouTube videos, uh, even like our user groups, our ladies, lots of diverse local and global groups. So I think this is really, really, really one strength of the R community, and especially ggplot tidyverse. So yeah, I can highly recommend that on from, from that perspective. So it shouldn't be that hard to find something. And even lots of the books are open access. So even if you sell them, you can will find an online version to kind of save to your bookmarks and quickly search through. So I think that's great. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, R has just done, it's not even the R project, it's just the community has done a masterclass is developing itself. It's crazy to see, uh, like I, I once really used ggplot extensively and yeah, just Twitter was very active at the time, probably still is, but maybe less so. Uh, and yeah, it's just a great community for R users. I think on that note of Slack, the three channels that I think I've gleaned the most advice from and the most help from, whether I ask that advice or whether I just passively consume it after others ask, which is one of the key perks of these communities, uh, are DVS, uh, Elevate, Dataviz membership, and Friends of the Pudding. So the Pudding is a really cool digital storytelling publication. Um, I won't tell you what tool they use, but you might be able to guess. Uh, and they actually, if you pay for their Patreon, just like $2 a month, they'll let you into their Slack channel where people are all very data viz oriented and they ask code questions. Um, so that's another kind of great little community to enter if you have those questions. That's great. I know one of the books actually that even got nominated this year for one of the um, exemplary book awards, one of the nominees was actually uh, one that was written using R as the actual tool. And it was Klaus Wilkie's book um, that has a lot about data visualization fundamentals, but through a lens of using R. And so if you're someone who works in that space, this whole entire book is free and open source. You can actually scroll through this whole thing and learn all about different components of data visualization design in really interesting ways. And all the examples are built out in R. And so we'll go ahead and we'll put a link to this into the chat um, here on YouTube and LinkedIn. So you can go ahead and take a peek. But uh, yeah, it's a great resource if you're looking for resources that are out there. Um, yes, guys, uh, Sandra. <laughs> Yes, a uh, good example. I mean, again, all the codes from, of these plots are available um, for free. So um, even if there's no code in there, like, it was exciting to read the book because you just, I mean, I personally was just thinking, how did he do that? There's not super fancy plots, but yeah, all of this is shared. Uh, in another one, because you mentioned the Slack channels, um, it's obviously the R for Data Science book. It's, it's the more general book, how to do data wrangling and modeling, but also visualization. And they have the dedicated um, Slack channel 
with mentors. So you can just go there. Basically, it's your self-paced reading club. And then they have, like, for every chapter, they have dedicated channels. You can just ask questions. So I'm a bit active, but, they're, again, mentors, like, really taking a lot of care and time to answer questions related to that. So that's definitely also something if you're just starting out with R uh, to go. And yeah, if you're into geo um, and R again, then there's also the geo computation in R book, which is also freely available and a few more. So yeah, quite some resources. You want something? Hi. Um, uh, the, I'm, yep, sorry. Hi. <laughs> I'm getting into the Power BI community lately, which I know has not been the focus today, but is also, uh, it's very different, but very supportive. Um, two sites that are great, Guy in a Cube and SQL BI, uh, both have tons of free videos, but they also have really active communities and forums, um, different levels of, of both sort of code heavy and non-code heavy approaches. I historically have not been sort of a YouTube video person, but for a tool like Power BI, which is very GUI driven, and there's lots of like, where is this button supposed to be? They can be very helpful. In Dax Guide. Dax Guide. Not as interactive. You don't have to ask questions there, but in terms of learning the functions and like searching for something specifically, great resource. A lot better than what Microsoft gives on explanation. Of Dax. I said I don't have Dax. Yes. Uh, I think Amanda's putting it in the chat, but Dax Guide is um, sort of just a better version of the document, the Microsoft documentation for Dax, the programming language uh, for the front end of Power BI. And is yeah, it's not as much a community, but more a resource, and is great. And Colin oh, turned me onto it, and I really like it. Something I recommend following Cedric and Connor <laughs> and all the other amazing people at CBS because they post such amazing uh, tutorials and. Thank you. All our awesome Thank presenters. You. Here's a quick question, actually, before you leave the stage, uh, Ben, that might be relevant to you as you're in your current role. And then we might wrap up with a few wrap-up questions. Um, does anyone know if Power BI custom biz can use JavaScript? Yes. Uh, the short answer is yes. The, the long answer is longer, obviously. But um, basically, Power BI can ingest um, data from, from R and Python, off, which is often a, a great sort of way if you want to do more advanced data modeling um, that Power BI doesn't have the capacity to do. And then the inverse of that is uh, creating custom visuals in D3 or JavaScript. Um, it's basically just like a little iframe window into, into Power BI. It doesn't necessarily have all of the nice um, interaction where like all the different Power BI pieces talking to each other gets a little more complicated if you're building charts in JavaScript, but it is definitely doable. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Uh, well, let's, let's, I know this is a fun game. You should see what the room looks like as we play a musical chairs team. It's pretty fun and never a behind the scenes look. Um, Lindsay, I'll ask you, you're one of our in-person people who joined us today for the workshops. Anything from all of this that you sat through today that sticks out to you? Maybe join us in the fishbowl by the microphone <laughs> if you're, if you're so inclined. Oh. Our goal was to make this an interactive space for our participants here in person to be able to chime in too. And I feel like we've gotten to hear more from our virtual attendees almost. <laughs> Yeah, I think it was both uh, reassuring and also um, a little bit uh, like uncomfortable to learn that my tool hopping is also done by others <laughs> that are doing this <laughs> and have been doing this a lot longer than I have. So I guess it's a confirmation that it's okay to not do everything all in one place and that it doesn't have to be perfect in one place. Um, and also that, is that true? No, I'm just joking because I, I'm a perfectionist and just can't speak. No, 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 no. Um, but I'm also like excited to know that there are ways to get started and then um, ways to get to perfect, right? So doing both. Yeah, definitely. Whatever fits you. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks, Lindsay.
the uh, as we go ahead and wrap up today, there were some great questions kind of on kind of forward looking things on how we use these tools. And I'd love to just kind of open up closing words around kind of careers. We didn't open this conversation with a what do you do for your job question that you use these tools, if anything. But uh, Jarrett Harris asked the question, has anyone transitioned from a more full stack front end web developer role to mostly data biz and any thoughts? Um, and if you've made a career transition, whether it's kind of full stack software developer to data biz or something else to data biz amongst our presenters, um, let's go ahead and close with talking about kind of what that looks like and what are you doing today? How did you land there in uh, about a minute each? So Max, can I uh, tee up to you to go ahead and talk a little bit about where you are career wise first and we'll start with you and then move from there. Yeah, I'm a data visualization engineer, or right now I'm freelance, but I will be, I am doing data visualization engineering. My new role will also be data visualization engineering. Um, so I, I did take a full stack coding class. I mean, I was never like a full stack developer since I went into it knowing that I wanted to do, to do data visualization. But it was actually very useful because since I like to do more like front end and I also use Felt, um, you learn about APIs and a lot of different um, front end tools. So versus like doing something like data science where it might be more analysis, they're kind of just like different, different goals. Um, so I can't really talk about the pros or cons of being the full stack, but I mean, if you, if you like data vision, that would be the biggest pro. In should probably just go do that. Okay. Well, we have a little feedback here. I'm not sure why. Okay. Yeah. This is an order of operations issue. Yeah, it's like. Do you want to start? Sure, yeah. Um, so I have not made that formal transition. I'd say I'd kind of done the opposite, where I learned data visualization at first, and that was really my passion or is my passion, I don't want anybody to get the wrong idea. Uh, but it was through learning data visualization that I was introduced to the fundamentals of the web. And then I kind of learned how to make a website because I knew how to make a chart and they're more similar than you'd think. So it's kind of the inverse. Um, and if you're looking to make that career transition, I'm not sure who asked the question, but feel free to reach out to me in particular because I've seen the other side of that coin. So I might be able to speak to it a little bit and compare the industries. And then to answer the other question, right now I'm a, data visualization engineer, I guess. I don't know if I have a formal role. And like information designer uh, at a firm called Moksha Data Studio in Houston, Texas. So we make charts for people. <laughs> That's really good. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a trained researcher. So I studied life sciences, went to an ecology, nature, conservation, and evolution, and then got into computational biology, doing a lot of, lot of simulation studies and spatial analysis. Um, ending up with R because that's what ecologists use. So lots of the R development actually was driven by those people, to be honest. And then um, the tidyverse kicked in for the data science, made it very popular. And during that time, I found also ggplot 2 So that was really, I was not enjoying it. I'm also not, I mean, I have to say I'm not a programmer, which is obviously a lie because I'm programming every day. But at the same time, many people coming from the true IT background or whatever you want to phrase it, they often don't like R because it's some silly language which has a <laughs> bit different things going on, which is actually what I like about it because I don't want to worry about compilers and I don't know, true debugging and stuff. That's definitely not a functional programmer. Um, I'm also not a very structured learner, so I pick up whatever I need. So I picked up a lot of HTML, CSS, a bit of JavaScript now, um, learned a bit of C++, didn't really like it, tried to learn Python, fell back to R because it felt much easier. <laughs> so yeah, I kind of like have a mixed route here. Um, and now since, yeah, almost three years, two years, um, I'm a freelancing database person, whatever, designer, consultant, instructor, I don't know, still haven't figured out. There's so many terms for that. So yeah, I'm giving a workshop on database in general and ggplot2 and how to use R, but also doing a lot of mixed things. So people come here for me like because of the ggbot, so they have already a ggbot workflow and say like, we need to automate things. We need a clever way how to solve it or we just need to redesign. We don't know or we don't have the time to do that. And you seem to know that. Others just come for the design and they don't care which tool I use. So I pick whatever I need to get the job done. Uh, but often it starts with R, doesn't necessarily end with R. 
Amazing. Well, lots of really amazing career journeys in terms of where that's gone and where people have kind of taken themselves. I'll say my roots as the current DBS executive director are that I was a public health researcher and evaluator turned data visualization practitioner. And I don't write code in D3 or, or in JavaScript or in R. So all of that seems intimidating to me still. And I'm happy to go ahead and admit that on stage and on a recording. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, it's been great to have everyone here today. We're hitting our wrap up point for the conversation. It has been fantastic to have Max joining us from the West Coast and for doing her great workshop today. And also having um, Cedric and Connor both join us here as well as everyone else in the room around here in Washington, DC. We've got some other folks hanging out in the corner. Um, we really appreciated folks who took the time to join into the virtual workshops as well as joining in on the in-person sessions. If you don't have plans yet tomorrow or you haven't signed up for them or just for waiting to be super inspired today by the conversation we have of beautiful programming leading up to the Information is Beautiful Awards. We've been hosting these in part because we really want to focus on the fact that IIB is more than, for us, more than just having a conversation about data visualization and giving awards to people and naming the best in show, but about encouraging our kind of collective learning and celebrating excellence in data visualization. And so our day of inspiration continues tomorrow with a day of programming that starts at 10 a.m. Eastern time and then wraps up at 3 p.m. In the morning, we've got keynote addresses from Duncan Clark, the CEO at Flourish in Canva. Um, who's the data visualization lead at Canva, as well as from Dr. Brandeis Marshall, who recently released her book, Data Conscience, who's talking about why we shouldn't just move fast and break things, so data ethics. And then our team from Excella, led by Leslie Welch, is gonna be leading a panel about data careers. So if you're interested in career conversations, a great time to tap in. The afternoon will feature shortlist the lightning talks. So if you're interested in learning about the making of different visualizations and 10 minute snippets, um, it's a great place to go ahead and learn those a little bit. But with that, we'll go ahead and we'll wrap up and we'll sign off today. I'll put the link in the chat box for anyone who might have missed the opportunity to sign up for those workshops tomorrow. Um, there's opportunities to sign up to join us in person or online. And we can't wait to see more folks joining us tomorrow and to announce the winners of the Information is Beautiful Awards tomorrow night. And <laughs> that's a great, great motion, Cedric. To announce the winners and to share and celebrate the wonderful things happening in our data biz community. So with that, we'll wrap up. Uh, sign off from everyone. Thank you so much for your time today. And we'll close out and dismiss everyone to enjoy the rest of their evening. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>